My latest video compares a relationship with a narcissist to playing heads or tails with someone who is being dishonest and is cheating. There are a few key takeaways I thought it would be helpful to break down, which is what I'm going to share in this video. And if you haven't seen the video I'm referring to, you can click right here to watch it. The first takeaway is that in a relationship with a narcissist, there is some kind of promise of perfection. There's a promise that they will be able to deliver something that you have been hoping that you might be able to get. A few key elements here is the promise without any proof that they can actually deliver something and the fact that this feeds off hope. When we hope we are going to get something, we stop being rational and that's one way they short circuit our rational brain. The second point is that when it comes to the promise, they let you fill in the details. Obviously, they don't know exactly what it is that you're hoping for, and they usually find ways to make you tell them what they want. For instance, one person whom I refer to in a series of videos seemed to have the same musical tastes as me, and I was absolutely amazed that we liked the same bands. But at one point, I dug a bit deeper, and I asked about one of the bands what her favorite song was and favorite album, and she had no clue. There was no answer. And it was much later that I realized that simply she'd seen that I had about 12 albums of this band. Therefore, I'd understood that I liked them, and therefore all she had to do was tell me that she liked them also. I obviously was not digging too much at first because I thought it was great, and I didn't think it would be worthwhile challenging. Always remember, when they show you a picture that you want to see, it's highly likely that they let you fill in the details, and all they had to do was confirm and say, yes, that's right, that is what I've been thinking all along. The third point is that they want to extract attention or energy away from you. In this parable, I liken it to them giving you electric shocks because there's something rather unpleasant about it. We could imagine the electric shock as a little bit like them taking your reserves of energy. Always remember, if their goal is to extract attention or extract energy from you, that's very different to if they walk into a relationship looking to get a win-win situation where the two partners give each other energy and maintain their own energy. In another video, I likened narcissists to vampires who want to simply suck the life or suck the blood out of their victims. And this image is not completely crazy. If we remember they want to extract energy and attention from you, then a lot of their behavior makes much more sense. And number four, this is one of the things that people don't understand. They use drama in order to extract the energy and the attention. Most of us dislike drama. We don't enjoy it. We don't thrive on it. And this is one of the traits that narcissists hijack. If they always have the threat of drama, they can get away with whatever they want. And if drama occurs, they're extremely happy to indulge in the drama. They enjoy it. This is the image of pigs that enjoy wrestling in the mud. When you observe someone, see if they are trying to avoid unnecessary drama or if they are trying to foster unnecessary drama. With toxic people, quite often, you will notice that they smirk when drama is occurring. They will smirk when you lose it, whereas most healthy people will not be enjoying it and they will try to find ways to avoid having the drama. If you see systematically that you are the one making concessions to avoid the drama and they are the ones creating it, that's a rather bad sign. And point number five that goes hand in hand with this is they will blame you for the drama and they'll do that with a smile. They will say that the reason why the drama occurred is because you said something or you didn't say something or you thought something or you should have done something or you shouldn't have done something or you should have thought that you were going to do something or whatever hallucination they will come up with. It's easy to think that they are being serious, but when you see that in their narrative, everything is always only your fault, that's a really bad sign. When they take no ownership, no responsibility, that's a sign that something is toxic. When they shift all the blame onto you, that's a sign that something is toxic. Remember to be aware of this so that you don't fall for it. And this leads us to point number six. They invent reasons for the drama. There is no logic. 
and what they say does not make sense when you put two and two together. Usually, if there's some kind of drama, we want to understand what led a person to go there. We want to understand the reasoning, even though we know that most of the time people aren't really being rational, they hallucinate the reasons. Nonetheless, there tends to be a willingness to understand the other person, what leads them to do something, and just a bit of communication to try to understand where someone is coming from. When we do this with a toxic person, they're likely to express one reason and the opposite of the reason, simply to see which one sticks. When someone keeps telling you opposites at the same time, and they don't make sense, and they're not coherent, and you can't anticipate what they're going to say, or how they think, then it might be a sign that simply they're playing you, and they're just talking absolute garbage and rubbish all the time. But obviously, if you want to understand them, you're likely to ask questions, which leads us to point number seven. When you try to understand them, instead of having a conversation and explaining, they'll try to deflect from the topic, often by blaming you, and if they don't manage, they are likely to simply get angry and throw anger in your face. Why is this the case? Most of us don't like to make other people angry. If we tend to be higher on empathy, we might believe that the reason why someone is getting angry is because of what we said, or is because of the questions that we asked. Therefore, the lesson tends to be stop asking so many questions, because if you ask questions, then people are going to get angry. I suggest thinking in terms of cause and effect. If we remember that when we ask questions, the person gets angry, that tells us to stop asking questions. But generally in a healthy relationship, we like to understand the other person and also we like to be understood. And usually in a healthy relationship, part of the communication is about trying to understand ourselves better and be to some extent accepted and gain some introspection, and have someone else uncover our blind spots. When we have this mindset, it makes us vulnerable to toxic people people who abuse this mindset. That's why we have to be very careful when we see that someone is being a bad faith actor. Number eight is extremely important. They will often have mood swings. They'll be in a good mood and suddenly in a bad mood. They will switch quickly, so it's difficult to anticipate. This means that we seldom feel comfortable if we know that we're walking around a loose cannon or a volcano and we have to walk on eggshells. And one of the points here, when they have the mood swings, they'll often blame it on you. They'll blame it on your attitude. They'll blame it on what you do or what you don't do, or what you say or what you don't say. And quite often they will say that if you don't improve things or if you don't stop doing things, then they will leave. Now, this is one of the cruxes of the manipulation. If they threaten you with this, you either have the possibility to stand up and say, I don't think you're being reasonable, so you are free to leave if this is not working out for you and it's not easy to do that, or you buy into their narrative and you're afraid, and that means you have to start lying and going along with the lies in order for them to stay. When they do this, this is simply a test to see to what extent they can manipulate you and to what extent they have got leverage and power over you. Until you are aware of this, it's easy to be manipulated, and that is likely to further entrap you, further ensnare you in a toxic relationship. But of course, this is not sustainable, and this leads us to number nine. When they're no longer capable of extracting energy or attention from you because you're, you're too tired, this means that when they make the cost result analysis, it's no longer interesting for them to stay around. When it's no longer interesting for them to stay around, they might try to squeeze the last bits of energy out of you, but it's more likely that they will look for a new supply and someone else, and probably one of the people they had hoovering around for quite a long time. Remember that for them, you're simply a source of energy. The thing that comes to mind is these packs of drinks with a straw that you put in. Once it's empty, you throw it away and you get another one. I don't know if this is exactly how they see human beings, but it's roughly how they treat other people. And if that's where they treat you, there's no reason to be surprised. And finally, the last one, number 10. Remember we started with them saying that the prize that you could get would be all of your dreams come true? Just remember, that prize never was really available in the first place. They promised you could get it. They promised it would be there, but they made it up as they went along. And they let you fill in all of the blanks. It never was there. It never was available. All of that was simply a hallucination in your head. It was simply a mirror that they shone back onto you. And so what you were seeing is what you were hoping for, but it wasn't really there. It wasn't really real. Something to remember is all human beings are mixed 
bags, we all have sort of advantages and disadvantages, pluses and minuses, good sides and bad sides. And all of this changes and mixes depending on the situations. We're all human. No one is perfect. And no two people are completely entirely made for each other if they're being honest with each other. There always will be at least a few things that bother us in other people. If we can find someone with whom things work out well enough and they're genuine and authentic and we can work through differences, that is fantastic. When someone claims to be exactly the right person for you to completely match you, odds are they are lying to you and they are simply deceiving you by feeding your fantasies. Now, one of the difficulties here is if you want to believe in a fantasy, it's very difficult to let go of not only the person in front of you, but the hope that someone might fit your fantasies to a T. But also, I think this is a rather important part of growing up and becoming an adult, is accepting we're all flawed. We all have things that are rather nice about us and things that are not that nice. And if we can learn to accept people as full and complex human beings, then we get far more fulfilling relationships. And for me, this was key in my own journey, was to realize I no longer want someone to perfectly fit that which I hope. I simply want something that's true and genuine and honest. I can deal with packages. I decide if I like or I don't like the package, but I can deal with honesty and truth. And usually you can work through things if we're being honest and respectful. But I'd far prefer a reality that is true and not that glamorous to something that is glamorous and is a complete lie. Because as we know, lies lead to hell. And if we are playing a game that is designed to fail, because the prize never was there in the first place, and it's designed to make us pay the price of our failure all the time and always blame us, well then maybe we're simply being viewed as a supply of energy and attention to a bad faith player. And that kind of game is simply called a scam.